So hello everyone and welcome to this spotlight where we shine a light on authors and translators from around the world. I'm Lisa Carter, founder and creative director of Intralingo and the host of this show. Today, I am so pleased to welcome the author Hamid Ismailov and translator Shelley Fairweather Vega. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It's nice to be here. Great. So, you know, this show probably won't air for a couple of weeks. So for those who are listening, it's late March. Um, we are in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. I think it would be disingenuous not to at least acknowledge that. Um, I'm in Canada. Hamid, you're in the UK. Shelly, you're in the US. We're all under varying states of emergency and lockdown. Um, so before we get started, I'd just like to know how you are and uh, how you're feeling in this very surreal time. I'm in fact in Prague, you know, in, uh, you in Kafka Prague? City. Yes, in Kafka City. And the situation is quite Kafkaesque, you know. Uh, I'm always imagining what uh, Kafka would, would have written, you know, could uh, be here alive nowadays. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm rereading uh, The Plague of uh, Camus, you know, and all of a sudden I realized that in uh, Of Strangers and Bees, I've got a huge chapter about the plague, you know, of the medieval plague as well. Yes. Isn't it amazing how literature reflects life and vice versa? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Shelley? I've been thinking about the, that chapter in Of Strangers and Bees as well, the plague in, in Florence a long time ago, and um, how we have certain similarities here in our situation. Here mm -hmm. in we've had, uh, you know, germs circulate for a while now, so we're getting used to being at home all the time, no school. Um, but as a translator, you know, I always work from home anyway, so for me personally, um, it doesn't make too much difference, um, except for the general kind of atmosphere around me. So concentrate on work and keep, keep some things going as normal. Yes, yes. Well, I'm particularly glad to be chatting with you both. I'm grateful for technology that allows this to happen. Um, and just for the opportunity, yeah, to, to get outside of ourselves and, and to think about literature and think about the world and something other than, than the news right now. So, um, Hamid, um, you are a polyglot, a writer, uh, a translator as well. Um, we're here today to talk about two of your books, um, actually, of Strangers and Bees, and also um, Gaia, Queen of Ants, uh, which Shelley translated and are now recently available in English. Um, could you maybe just introduce us a little bit to the books, Hamid? They're quite different, uh, both uh, in their uh, sort of titles, they contain the insects, but one was written in 1999, the original uh, in Uzbek was written in 1999, and it was my first Uzbek novel uh, mm. of Strangers and Bees. In Uzbek it was called Hai Ibn Yagzan. Hai Ibn Yagzan is uh, one of the oldest maybe um, uh, subjects in the literature, you know, the uh, Abu Ali ibn Sina, who is known in the West as Avicenna, he was the first to write this uh, parable about a person traveling to unknown world of the West. And uh, at that time, in the 10th century or the 11th century, uh, it was quite uh, sort of, you know, it was quite strange to you know, travel to the West because everything was happening in the East at that time. So uh, this parable then started to move around, you know, in the Middle East, uh, other people started to repeat it, even to fail, for example. Then uh, there were Jewish translations of the same uh, um, subject, of the same plot. 
And ultimately, it ended up as the Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe, which was once again the uh, one of the variations of the same, uh, you know, of the same uh, subject and plot as a person uh, in his solitude is somewhere in an unknown world. So that was the. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the first impulse why I decided to write this novel. I was in the West myself. It was quite unknown to me because I was a Soviet product at that time, completely different by uh, sort of, you know, by my uh, out bringing, uh, upbringing, by everything, you know, by my outlook. So I was quite different to the Western world. And my discovery of the Western world was similar to Robinson Crusoe's, you know, discovering of his island. So that was the first impulse why I decided to write. But then uh, because the first uh, variation of this uh, subject was created by uh, Ibn Sina, I decided to uh, keep uh, everything to him, you know, he is a stranger in my uh, novel, he travels throughout the world, but uh, he, uh, he travels in time rather than uh, in space, though in space too. Uh, so, and then the B came as the, you know, because the beginning of this novel starts with the scene when uh, if Avicenna finds the elixir of eternal life. And he hands it over to his uh, apprentices, you know, to apply this elixir when he dies. He dies and the apprentice tries to apply this, uh, this elixir to the body of his uh, teacher. But in the middle of the, uh, this appliance, all of a sudden a bee appears and stinks the hand of the uh, apprentice and he drops the elixir so and the bee consumes this elixir so bee is becoming the eternal uh, creature but avicenna becomes sort of half uh, eternal you know he is a ghost which travels through the millennium so that is the sort of you know the setup of the novel Yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite a novel. <laughs> it, it also the it the, third, <laughs> the third the um, third uh, protagonist in the novel is of course um, the sheikh. He, he's a um, a writer, a writer in exile. Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, which partly was based on my own experience, partly on the experience of other people, you know, like me who traveled to the West or, or were forced to leave the country and end up in the West. So it was a sort of, sort of collective, in a way, experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and as do you think this was your... Yeah, as for the Go second ahead. book, it's uh, completely different and it's written uh, uh, recently. One of the maybe penultimate uh, novel of mine. Uh, and it's about, you know, we uh, always talk about the dictators in our part of the world, uh, in stance, because um, uh, this part of the world is famous for its dictatorships, for authoritarian regimes, but we always talk about the dictators not paying any attention to their wives, you know. Uh, basically, these dictators, they run the countries, but they are run by their wives in a way. and. All of them, they are extremely strong iron ladies. Nearly all of them. I researched, you know, many of them as a biographer. And I looked through their biographies, through their sort of, you know, uh, through their lives. They are iron ladies who are running uh, the sort of, you know, the, the dictators themselves. And nobody pays attention to them. So I decided to write one of them, uh, which is uh, Gaia or Gaia. But at the same time, you know, when you start to call her Gaia, it immediately brings 
all the myths of the world, you know, about Gaia, the Greek goddess, and so on and so forth. So it's, once again, it's quite complicated sort of mixture of myths, of reality, of uh, uh, current situation. That's a fascinating perspective I hadn't considered. Um, obviously, it's clear in the novel that as protagonist, she is the wife of a very high level um, Soviet um, you know, leader, but I hadn't realized that uh, it was intentional to show that perspective about these iron ladies. Hmm. Okay. And Shelley, both of these novels are translated from the Uzbek. Um, we, I would love to hear about your connection to, to the Uzbek language, but also then how you and Hamid began collaborating and how both of these novels came out very recently, um, one after the other. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, the coincidence of having both of the novels and my translation come out um, just within the space of a couple of months is a coincidence, really. Um, I think I was trying to translate them back to back um, in 2015 and 2016, um, thanks to uh, Hamid winning a grant from Arts Council England to have three of his novels translated. Um, the first one that came out was uh, called Devil's Dance in English, um, which won the EBRD Literature Prize. Um, and then uh, Mine Too came out a couple months, well, within a, within a year after those. So Hamid is my a big, a big year or two for his uh, books and translation. Um, but we started working together um, a couple of years again before that, um, before the grant. Um, so the first, um, uh, Hamid contacted me um, when he noticed um, a, an essay I had translated from Uzbek by an Uzbek political prisoner. Do you remember this, Hamid? <laughs> yes, I do. It was um, about Mamad Ali Mahmoudov, yes. A, so that, um, that was published online through um, a, a pen project and a, I think a Translators Without Borders project. Um, and Hamid um, found a way to get in touch with me after that um, and told me at the time he thought I was the only American who understood Uzbek. Mm -hmm. I must say here, sorry to book, uh, interrupt you, but uh, I was amazed that there is in the world a translator from Uzbek. I was considering that the only translator from Uzbek is my son, you know, when I'm bribing him and <laughs> sitting <laughs> along with him, you know, and translating together with him, you know. But all of a sudden, uh, uh, I discovered Shelley as a wonderful translator from Uzbek. That was one of my, you know, biggest discoveries in my life because <laughs> Uzbek is so rarely, sort of, you know, taught or studied in the West. So I was amazed. Yeah, it was absolutely. It, it, since then, there's more of us now. We're multiplying. Um, so, <laughs> I, you know, every few months I meet another, another, and then there's been some great um, kind of classic Uzbek literature published in English just in the past year as well. Mm. Um, by two um, young American men translators. Um, and we're always looking for more interesting Uzbek literature to translate. So I know, Hamid, you have some work hiding, uh, waiting for attention, and I'm trying to discover more authors as well. Um, I started learning that, um, uh, <laughs> I read the story recently in graduate school. I've been studying Russian for a long time, running Russian courses to take, but the State Department offers a, a flash fellowship in strategically important languages. Um, that. Um, so I took the money and then took the courses. So Uzbek paid for my uh, master's degree, basically. Oh, okay. Interesting. But not a romantic story. It's a practical story. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's it's an interesting story because as you say, Hamid, I mean, I, I can't think of any other Uzbek translators. So it is, uh, you know, it's not a language many of us uh, learn or a country many of us know anything about, really. Yes, that's true. And uh, the majority of Uzbek literature is translated via Russian. But because they are completely different sets of languages, so the translations from the translator Russian is becoming a sort of, you know, Chinese whispers, basically. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we also, it also brings up a lot of questions of um, politics too and cultural clashes and, you know, um, something that's occurred to me a lot that I've been thinking about in the last year or two is how so many people only see Central Asian culture and history and literature through the lens of, of uh, Russian culture and Soviet culture. Um, and isn't there something more underneath there that we might be missing that's native to those regions and those people that we don't have to look at it through Russian eyes? Um, if we look at it more directly through their own languages and culture, um, won't we work, learn a lot more and uh, experience mm -hmm. in a different way? So that's part of my question as a, as a translator of Central literature as well. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that, Shelley, in your introduction to Of Strangers and Bees and, and how, in, you know, that particular um, novel kind of did come through a couple of lenses. You had some drafts in Russian, some in Uzbek, and so to a certain extent, um, you, it is a bit of a kaleidoscope that then is reflected in, in its, a very unique way in English, a unique creation. Yeah, kaleidoscope is a good a good metaphor for it for sure. Mm -hmm. the more you know, the more angles we can look um, look at it from, the uh, more of a complete a picture we'll get, kind of a three D image rather than a two D. So, um, if anything, I hope that the multiplicity of languages helps uh, present a better story in the end. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. You know, that, that is what, um, you know, translation purports to do and does do, but I do think it is particularly fascinating in this context that this particular book, um, uh, it didn't all come through one lens. Right. Yeah. Fabulous. So, um, you know, you, you said that these two books have come out recently, even though they were started earlier. Your other book, Hamid, came out not that long ago, the one that won the EBRD prize. Um, to what do you attribute this interest in um, either Central Asian literature or Uzbek literature or even just work in translation? Um, you know, for those of us uh, from the English speaking world, you know, I know that only about 3% of books are translated, but it does seem to be growing. What are your thoughts on why that might be? Generally, that, uh, <laughs> this summer, I gave uh, last summer, I gave a talk, you know, about the, uh, the industry of translation, you know, into mm -hmm. the Western languages. And what I found, you know, uh, discussing the issue and looking into the issue and researching the issue, that generally the um, publishing industry acts like uh, our sort of, you know, uh, home uh, offices or sort of, you know, uh, immigration offices. It's exactly the same, you know. Uh, generally, what is translated into the Western languages is known unknowns, you know. For example, the majority of the books translated into English, for example, are French books or German books, then uh, Scandinavian books, you know. So th they are very uh, easily digestible, but there is something different in them, yeah? Uh, for example, you can recognize everything culturally. You can recognize everything, but there is snow, for example, you know, uh, which is quite an exotic thing for, uh, for an English reader, let's say. But when it comes to the unknown unknowns, you know, like, for example, the Uzbek or other small cultures, yeah, it's extremely difficult to make them uh, sort of, you know, noticed uh, in the Western world. It's extremely difficult. I'm working in this area starting from 1994, yeah, and the first time, for example, the, one of my books was noticed, uh, let's say in 2016, you know. So it takes quite a lot of effort to make your work uh, become sort of, you know, noticed. So there are different strategies here. One of the strategies, for example, to write in English, let's say, about your world, yes. And some writers, they are doing that. For example, uh, Hosseini is doing, he is writing about Afghanistan in English, yeah. It's uh, one of the strategies. Or Elif Shafak, for example, writing about Turkish world, let's say, in English. So it's one of the strategies. 
But there are other strategies when you are writing about your uh, own uh, world in your own language. It's much more difficult to be noticed in that case. I do believe that there will be a time when the Uzbek writers will start to write, for example, their work about uh, Central Asia, let's say, in English. It will be much more easy to notice them, you know. But uh, it's a choice of a writer, you know, whether he wants to go this way or not uh, wants to go this way. Mm -hmm. And Shelley, you, you provide some translator's notes or translator's introduction to both of the books in a way, I guess, to kind of address a little bit about what Hamid is talking about there, that um, to make the unfamiliar slightly more familiar, to, to draw the reader in without, you know, sort of, um, uh, or letting them know that they're in good hands and that one way you put it was, you know, to take something that is um, unknown to us and make it both, um, you know, intimate, but accurate. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting balancing act um, when I translate books like this that I don't have to do when I translate Russian novels, for example. Um, and Hamid mentioned, you know, French literature in Russian or, or Spanish language literature. You know, a lot of Americans and Canadians have traveled to Mexico City or to Paris, and they can imagine themselves there. They can picture the city. They know how to pronounce the foreign words, you know, mm -hmm. but we can't take any of that for granted when we're translating a, a novel that takes place in Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one very basic thing that I have to talk about in the introduction is spelling and pronunci pronunciation. And then we have to manipulate the spelling. A lot of the conversations Hamid and I had um, with the editors of these books too, was how to spell things um, so that uh, it would be kind of as accurate as possible, reflecting the actual spelling in Uzbek, but also pronounceable to English readers. Um, so we don't want them um, pronouncing the names, you know, horrendously wrong in their heads. Um, so we have adjustments to make it a little more user friendly for, uh, for English speaking readers. Um, and you don't have to do that for, for every kind of world literature out there. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a really great example. And uh, as you noticed, I haven't said any of their names yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's also, you know, one of the other things you did, Shelley, apart from language was, you know, to start, especially in Of Strangers and Bees, is to, to give us a sense of the um, the literary history that Hamid was, you were referring to, you know, about what is the basis for this book and sort of the Sufi philosophy or background that goes with it that uh, we would unlikely be aware of. Yeah, that's an important aspect of the book and it's something I had to learn about it, translating as well, because it was just as for mm -hmm. So um, fortunately, um, Hamid is an expert and he's good at explaining things. What's interesting here, you know, uh, I'm amazed by what uh, Shelley does, because I've got several, uh, you know, metaphors for translation. One is, uh, for example, you know, you take a plant from completely different world, yeah, and uh, you plant it in your garden, for example, and it should look, uh, and it should uh, look like a sort of, you know, uh, at own place there. Or, for example, even better analogy is the sort of, you know, I was, uh, bringing up my child, let's say, in Uzbek tradition, yeah, in Uzbek tradition, because I'm writing basically for my Uzbek uh, readers uh, in the first place, uh, or for the Russian, if I'm writing in Russian. But Shelley takes this child, fosters him, and makes him a sort of, you know, a kind of an, uh, an American or an, an English person, you see? Uh, though he, until 12 years old, for example, uh, until the age of 12 years old, for example, this child was brought up as a purely Uzbek child, you know, because I'm writing uh, 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 sort of, you know, uh, in the Uzbek context with the Uzbek references, with the Uzbek culture in mind, and so on and so forth. But Shelley is making out of that something which is familiar to an American or to an English person. Books as children and translation as children and 
And I think that is such an apt metaphor because, um, you know, writers often do feel that their books are their children. Uh, and it, it really must be something then to see it in, a, in another language, in another culture. Um, Hamid, did you feel that a lot of explanation was required in either of your books to, I mean, you are perfectly bicultural. Did you feel that, you know, English readers um, needed more than your Uzbek readers got in the original? Uh, <laughs> to be absolutely honest, <laughs> I'm not very much in uh, sort of, you know, in translated books, you know, because uh, for me, the, 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 the labor is a labor, you know, At the moment when I deliver the book in the language, that is the main point, you know, I'd rather uh, sort of uh, think about the next book rather than sort of, you know, uh, being immersed into the translation and the fate of the translation. It's a bonus, you know, as a writer, you've got the bonus, especially when you are banned in your own country, so your readers are becoming uh, uh, international ones. But at the same time, but once again, being absolutely honest, I recently discovered that I'm doing nothing to help my translators, you know, in what sense? Uh, if I thought about translators, uh, so I would have written my uh, novels in a much easier way, you know. I recently sitting with my translator and translating uh, the sort of, you know, the what I'm saying, catacombs of my sentences was amazed how uh, ruthless I am towards the translators, you know, not thinking them at all, you know, because what I'm doing, for example, uh, uh, writing in Uzbek, I'm struggling with Uzbek, yeah, I'm fighting with Uzbek, because there are challenges of uh, sort of, you know, changing the language, changing the nature of language, changing the sort of, you know, the structure of language. Every writer sort of, you know, challenges the language in a way. So in that sense, I am struggling and fighting the Uzbek language, you know, not thinking about the uh, consecutive translation into English or into Russian or into French. So I'm in debt. Uh, in front of my translators, I am sort of, you know, apologizing in advance to my translators for uh, all the mayhem I am doing with my language. <clears throat> but that is the beauty of your books. And I'm sure, Shelley, for you, it is the beauty of translating Hamid's books. Yeah, certainly. I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because I don't think you need to apologize. Um, <laughs> the, the point is that, um, you know, authors should write the way they want to write, they need to write in the language they choose to express themselves. And the translators um, have to deal with it. We just have to deal with it. So I would hate to see um, an author, you know, simplify his language or, or change his approach um, in order to make translators' lives easier. Um, and, and Hamid, you've been a wonderful author to work with, so he does not... Um, I mean, uh, really is serious about this kind of handing over the child for, for adoption, um, um, I think. Um, he's very trusting um, and kind of leaves me to it when I'm doing the work. But at the same time, he's always there for questions. Um, so for Gaia especially, I sent him um, every passage as I translated it with some holes and some questions. And um, Hamid was very good about answering um, all my questions and giving me suggestions. But um, I could also tell that he trusted me to do what I thought needed to be done with the English. So, so I think uh, I think your translators um, can handle it, Hamid. <laughs> Don't change the way that you write, please. No, no, no. thank you. <laughs> It's certainly as a reader, I would hope that you write the way you write, because that's what you need to express. And, and absolutely, you know, we as readers, too, we have to trust the translators to, um, to pick up on all of those subtleties and portray them, bring them to us as best they can. And, uh, and every reader is going to interpret the book, um, you know, from their own perspective anyhow. So there is no one version of a book, is there? 
It's true. No, no, no. You are absolutely right. You know, and I'm <laughs> what I like with the sort of readings uh, in front of the readers because they come up with such a, an unusual questions and readings of the situations which you never imagined yourself while writing. You know, and uh, uh, because every reader recreates the book in his own sort of version in a way and you are discovering all these uh, uh, sort of you know uh, sideways or what you maybe m meant uh, you know uh, unco subconsciously or whatever but they are rationalizing your thoughts and it's so gratifying to meet the readers and to get the sort of stereoscopical view of your book Mm -hmm. It is. <clears throat> you know, I have to say that, um, uh, so I read Gaia Queen of Ants first, and then I read Of Strangers and Bees. And in a way, I'm very glad that it just happened to be that I read them in that order, because um, Gaia Queen of Ants is a very um, traditional story in many ways. There are, you know, the protagonists who interact, who have some sort of connection between them. It is a, a straightforward timeline. We have the backstory that informs, you know, their choices and their actions today. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then um, of Strangers and Bees is, is a completely different style of, of book, of fiction. Um, it is so much more philosophical. The three voices are very distinct and um, separate. Their stories are connected, but not as intimately. And what I found when reading Of Strangers and Bees, it was a case of, <clears throat> pardon me, recognizing um how little i know and feeling somewhat as a reader um perhaps not up to the task until i got part way through the book maybe about halfway or something <clears throat> and i think one of the themes of this book is it is the search for knowledge that's important and not the end result um, and I felt so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but therefore I, it's non-linear, you know, because it doesn't give the ultimate answer, you know, it leaves you in a sort of, you know, in uh, the realm of the possibilities, opportunities, rather than gives a sort of, you know, a certain answer to all your questions. That is the main thing which I discovered uh, with Avicenna himself, you know. He was a philosopher and he was the ultimate philosopher. He could have given the ultimate answer, you know. But funny enough, when he created all his philosophy, when he sort of polished everything with his logic, everything with everything, yeah, all of a sudden he decided to forget everything uh, rational and came to the mysticism. He wrote a new, uh, completely new book uh, for him, for his tradition, uh, you know, for his rationality, which was called the philosophy of the uh, Orientals, which is a mystical uh, thing. And because it was mystical, it was lost. You know, and now we know that this book existed, but nobody can find it, and it should be like that. You know, the the ultimate uh, truth should be always escaping the human mind. You know, otherwise we will be sort of you know rigid and uh, sort of you know unflexible uh, beings. Yeah, it is important to to learn. I think the lesson that you said you learned, Lisa, that we don't have to understand all the time it's okay <laughs> <Keep it. laughs> mm -hmm. Good. so we try not to it, you know and i'm translating i try not to explain too much just enough you know um, but let people be a little bit a little bit lost sometimes let them wonder what exactly that means that turn of phrase um, and maybe the meaning will become more clear and maybe it won't but um it's okay to have a little mystery in life mm -hmm. literature <clears throat> Absolutely. And it is, you know, it is that, um, as you were talking about earlier, um, both Hamid and Shelley, um, about that 
you know, sort of um, Sufi basis for the novel in particular, which is uh, parables and riddles and um, it, it's not a thou shalt or thou shalt not. It, it is a philosophy. And, uh, and so that aspect very much comes through in the novel. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one thing I would like to talk about now is, you know, is one of the things that you pointed out in your introduction, Shelley, you know, is that uh, in terms of the novel of Strangers and Bees, is that, you know, um, the Sufi maxim is annihilating the ego and experiencing one's own life through the eyes of the other. Mm -hmm. To me, that is 100% what literature is and what translation is. And I would love to hear from you both about, about that thought. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it that way. Um, when we were writing that and Hamid, Hamid helped me with that, um, that description of Sufism for the introduction. Um, I wasn't going to explain anything. That's one of those things I was going to leave unexplained, but I think the, the editors of the publishing house wanted, um, you know, a, a short paragraph about Sufism in general. So then I had to try to explain it, um, <laughs> which didn't come easily, but you're right. It is a metaphor um, um, in a way for, for translation. So I may be, uh, I may have adopted Hamid's uh, children here and I'm um, raising them now, but they're also not, uh, not my children, they're their own people uh, as well. So I have to make sure I'm not making them in my image uh, to make them the way, you know, oh, uh, the way that they were meant, they were meant to, uh, for the, make them into the books they were meant to evolve into as they grew up in whatever culture, I suppose you could say. Um, it's hard to make up a metaphor on the fly, but I think that's how this one goes. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Hamid, do you have anything to say or to add to that just about Sufism and, and that notion of seeing, um, you know, through the other? Yes, I'm coming from a culture, you know, of uh, great Persian poets, for example, like Hafiz, like Rumi, and others. And I do cherish this tradition, you know, especially with Hafiz. Why he is so beautiful? Because he admits that he can't uh, sort of reach the ultimate uh, truth, you know, he admits. Uh, he's like, uh, you know, we always uh, can compare, for example, Bruce Lee with Jackie Chan. Yeah? Jackie Chan is much more sympathetic because he, is, he doesn't sort of hide his frailties, you know, weaknesses. He is a comic figure as much as he is a tragic figure. So the same was with the uh, Hafiz, you know, he never sort of, you know, uh, was hiding that he couldn't find the ultimate truth, you know? He accepted that this world is a mystery. One of the wonderful uh, sort of lines of him, uh, he is saying, uh, which means, uh, which means, uh, mm, just a moment. <laughs> this world was a treasure of secrets, but the hand of the destiny locked the door of it and handed over the key to the tormentor of my heart. So, so it was a secret, but at the same time, the key of the secret is given to the tormentor of the heart, you know. So you can feel the, uh, you know, the suffering that you can't uh, sort of, you know, open this uh, mystery or the secret, yeah. But at the same time, you are living with this mystery. And you are loving this mystery because it belongs to the key is in the hands of your beloved you know so it's sort of you know uh, layer upon a layer of the mysteries here 
So that is the philosophy which is, uh, you know, forgotten by people in a way, you know. If they accept this philosophy, they would be much more sympathetic towards each other, you know. They won't be thinking that they are the sort of owners of the ultimate truth. For example, I said that, that is the right way, yeah, that is the right way. Uh, for example, the, the radicals are saying that their ways is uh, uh, sort of right one. The opposition is saying exactly the same. We are right, you are stupid, and so on and so forth. So world is colorful thing rather than black and white. And all this poetry, all this philosophy is showing that richness of the sort of tapestry, you know, that the world is not sort of black and white and uh, uh, out of elements, but it's a rich tapestry as a sort of, you know, as a rug, for example, Persian uh, rug or kilim. Yeah. And then we have the novel of Strangers and Bees as a tapestry itself to all those different storylines, sometimes interweaving, sometimes not, um, you know, so individual struggles and triumphs of individual people and characters in different times and different places. So um, the philosophy is, you know, kind of acted out in the book as well as described. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it is. On that note, I would love for you both to read the introduction to read paragraphs of of strangers and bees and Hamid you're going to read it in Uzbek first and then Shelley you'll read your English translation yeah. that'd be wonderful okay so it's in Uzbek just the a paragraph just to have a gist of Uzbek Bolaligimda bo'lgan bir voqea esimdan chiqmaydi. Biz o'shanda Buxoro oblastining Romitan rayonidagi Afshona posyolkasida yashar edik. Bir kuni maktabimiz bilan ipak qurt uchun tut bargi terganimi yo mevali daraxt tanalarini chumollarga qarshi ohak bilan oxlaganimi, xullasi qishloq xo'jaligining navbatda turgan ishi uchun dalaga chiqqan edik. Ishdagi tanaffus payti men o'z o'zimga chalg'ib idora bog'iga tushib qoldim. Ilgari ko'rmagan ekanman bu bog'ni. Buvim aytib bergan jannat shu bo'lsa kerak deb o'yladim o'shanda. Zilol ariqlar pastda sharaqlab oqar. Mevalar dunyoda talash mevalar. Bu yerda do'p do'p yerga tushar. Yerning yumshog'ligidan esa ularni na zaha urar, na qurt yer edi. Bog'ning bir tarafi gulzor. Choshgoh oftobida rosa qizigan hidlar quyu-quyu qalqalarga tutilib, har tomon anqib, havoniyu undagi mendik bir mitti odamni sarqushu sarmast etar edi. Great. So this is from the, the prologue. Um, there was one episode from my childhood that I will always remember. At that time we lived in a village called Afshana in the Ramatan region of Uzbekistan's Bukhara province. On a particular day, I cannot forget, they had sent us out from school to work in the fields again, though I can't recall whether we were supposed to be picking mulberry leaves for the silkworms or whitewashing the trees to keep pests away. During a break, I wandered off alone and I found myself in the garden of the collective farm. I had never, been, I had never seen this garden before and I thought it must be the paradise my grandmother had told me about. Clear water gurgled through a canal at my feet. Everywhere, fruit fell to the earth in a hymn to creation. The ground was so soft, the fruit was unbruised and untouched by worms. Half the expanse was a flower garden, and aromas warmed by the midday sun surrounded me on all sides, intoxicating even the air, not to mention so small a person as myself. Did you want me to keep reading, Hamid, or is that enough to stop? No, no, you, can, you carry on, you carry on. I wandered down the paths of baked mud through the roses, and as I had seen my grandmother do, I sniffed cautiously at first, then plucked just one bud and tucked it behind my ear. Before moving my sun-seared head back into the garden's cool shade, I caught sight of the most majestic flower of all, and I thought I would take that one for my grandmother. Suffering the pokes and scratches, I pushed further into the thicket of roses. But when I reached that flower, I froze. It would have been a shame to pluck such a thing. There are many shades of the color red, but this red rose had none of the paleness of pink, none of the yellowness of orange, no velvety notes of darkness and no deep shades of burgundy. This one was the clean scarlet hue of a young child's blood. It's only now that I'm finding these words, of course. Then as a boy, I saw all of this with unsullied eyes and a pure heart. 
one thing I like about this passage is that it repeats again later at the very end of the book. Um, <laughs> you don't know until the very end what this story has to do with anything else in, in, in the novel, but then it comes back. So it, the pattern weaves back around in the tapestry to the end. Yes. <clears throat> and the poetry of that prologue is, is so beautiful. It is, uh, it's so evocative and it has such rhythm and to hear you both read it aloud is very, very special. Good. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you both so much for these two books. Um, I am encouraging everyone who's watching or listening to um, get a copy of Hamid Ismail Loves and Shelley Fair Fairweather Vega's translation of of Strangers and Bees, and also Gaia, Queen of Ants. They are spectacular books that really do help us see through the eyes of others, see a part of the world. Um, many of us um, may never see in person, but thank you so much to both of you for, for the conversation today and for the books. Thank you for bringing us together. Yes, thank you very much. It was wonderful to talk to both of you. It's my thank pleasure. You. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone who is either watching on YouTube or listening to the Intralingo World Lit podcast. Um, please subscribe to hear from more authors and translators from around the world. You can also go to podcast.intralingo.com uh, where you will find links to the social media profiles. It would be wonderful to hear from uh, any of you and all of you about this conversation or any of the conversations with authors and translators. Um, in the show notes below as well will be Hamid's bio. Shelley's bio, links to the books, which once again, I encourage you to contact your um, local bookseller or your library um, and to get yourselves a copy. Thank you very much for watching and for listening, and we will see you on the next episode of Spotlight. Mm -hmm.